Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this evening's webinar entitled Planning Your Farming Future, How to Stay Profitable in the Face of Change, uh, being held in association with Virgin Money. Uh, my name's Philip Clark. I'm the executive editor at Farmers Weekly, uh, and I'll be chairing this evening's discussion, where our panellists will attempt to explain some of the changes that are coming down the track and hopefully provide a few pointers as to how they feel that farming can stay in the black. Uh, it's been said before, it's a bit of a cliche, that uh, the one constant in life is change. Uh, but I can honestly say I can't remember a time when there's been quite so much up in the air as there is at the moment. Um, as we cover in Farmers Weekly this week, uh, markets and traders are still kind of finding their way uh, in the post-Brexit era, three months into that. Um, all kinds of problems uh, experienced by uh, traders looking, for example, to ship seed potatoes to the continent or even uh, putting secondhand machinery into Northern Ireland, uh, a whole manner of problems that people are only just starting to learn about. Um, sort of within these shores as well, uh, there's plenty of change in the air. Uh, Witness this week's vote uh, by potato growers uh, with regards to the future of the AHDB, uh, following on from the horticulture vote. Um, and on the domestic policy front as well, there's many questions that uh, remain to be answered. Although it does actually seem that uh, for English growers anyway, uh, there's a little bit more light at the end of the tunnel uh, with recent announcements on what um, public money for public goods might actually look like. Uh, but what does it all mean? Well, uh, don't ask me. Um, that's what our panellists are here for. Um, I think um, that hopefully they'll have a clearer idea uh, and they'll be able to give some pointers to, to the virtual delegates that we've got on the line. And on that subject, I'm pleased and slightly amazed to say that we had over 800 people register so hopefully a good fair few hundred will be watching this evening. Uh, I'll introduce the four panellists uh, in a moment, uh, each one ahead of uh, their presentations, which should last about five or six minutes each. And then uh, we'll move into the Q&A session, uh, which will be the chance for, for you to put uh, your questions and try and get answers to the things you want to hear. Uh, to ask a question is pretty straightforward. Uh, you just type it into the, the box on your screen and uh, hit submit. Um, I guess as in any real live conference, um, I'd make the usual chairman's request uh, to keep questions short and, and pithy and to the point. Um, avoid speeches or in this case, uh, essays. Uh, apart from anything else, the font on my screen is ridiculously small and it's, it's pretty hard to read. So uh, keep your questions to the point. Uh, we also plan to do a couple of quick polls, um, and uh, the first of which is coming up now. So I'll ask Ruth um, at the back end to uh, put the poll on the screen, which hopefully you'll see very shortly. Um, it's directed just at the farmers in the audience, so I imagine a big proportion are farmers, and asks, uh, are you considering or have you even expressed interest yet in joining the Sustainable Farming Incentive Pilot Scheme? Yes or no? So uh, please take part in that and we'll come back to the results uh, later on. But for now, I think uh, time to crack on with the presentations and uh, I'm delighted to uh, ask Janet Hughes from DEFRA to set the scene for us. Uh, looking at the bio, Janet is the director of DEFRA's Future Farming and Countryside Programme, uh, which is uh, responsible for transforming the way that we support and regulate farming and the countryside in England. Um, as I said, it finally feels like we're getting a little bit of detail starting to emerge with the recent announcement on the SFI, uh, but uh, hopefully Janet will be able to educate us a little bit further. So, Janet, over to you. Thanks very much, and thanks everybody for dialing in this evening on this what in London is a very lovely sunny day. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm Janet Hughes, Programme Director of the Future, Future Farming and Countryside Programme in DEFRA, and our job is to do everything that's involved in retiring the common agricultural policy and bringing in all of the new things that we're going to bring in. Um, and I'm just going to give you a quick recap of what that involves and then a, a couple of highlights of things that have either just, just happened or about to happen quite soon. So what the programme involves is we're trying to do two things at the same time. One is help the agriculture sector to be thriving, competitive, resilient and productive. And the other is to help that sector produce better environmental and climate change outcomes. And we believe that you can't have one of those without the other. 
that you can't have a thriving sector in the long term unless you take better care of the environment and you can't take care of the environment unless you have a thriving sector. And so everything that I'm about to tell you that we're doing it relates to both of those two things together. Um, and we're doing four main things through the programme. The first is that we're phasing out direct payments, as I'm sure you're aware. Starting from 2021, we'll be reducing direct payments to about 50% of their current level over the next four years. And all of the money that comes out of direct payments will be going back into the farming sector through either existing schemes or new schemes to support either environmental outcomes or productivity in the sector. And there's been a there's been a commitment by the government that that will that money will go back into the sector each year. And then. The way we're going to use that money is we're going to improve the regulatory system to make it fairer, more proportionate and more effective so that if there is genuine breach that is having a material impact on the environment that we can actually notice and enforce that, but that we're also being much fairer and more proportionate and supportive in the vast majority of cases where that's not happening. We're going to be looking after existing schemes and improving them. So we've it, we've introduced recently the improved countryside stewardship offer for 2022, um, and we're looking to simplify and improve the way that operates. And also we're gonna be introducing new schemes. So I'm sure you've all heard of environmental land management, which will have three schemes to help people produce, get paid to produce public goods on their land. And that will include the sustainable farming incentive where we've just launched an expression of interest for people to take part in our pilot of that scheme. And that's, the pilot is really a series of experiments where we want you to help us. It's our research and development wing. We want you to help us and learn with us about what this scheme should look like um, and how it can best work for farmers and achieve the outcomes that we're here to achieve. And the second scheme is the local nature recovery scheme. And that scheme is more aimed at the local level. So sustainable farming incentive is at the farm level. Local nature recovery is at the local level where lo people will collaborate in an area to set priorities and contribute to them together. And then the third scheme is landscape recovery, which is at the landscape level, where that will be more targeted at landscape land use change or recovery, such as peatland rest restoration, woodland creation, possibly rewilding. So that's environmental land management. And at the same time, we're also going to be investing in productivity and prosperity. And we've just today put out some information about our resilience support scheme, where we'll be providing free advice to farmers to help them plan their way through the transition and help you help you each work out how to be profitable through the transition as basic payments are phased out. We're also going to be providing grants to support productivity improvements, supporting innovation, research and development, both carrying it out and helping it to get adopted and supporting learning and development in the sector. And we're going to do all of that learning from the past and learning from what farmers and others tell us about what works and what doesn't. And the most important elements of those principles that we've adopted about how we're going to do this are that we're going to take a co-design approach and we are doing that now. And that means we work with farmers and with experts to design and iterate what we're doing and constantly improve it and make it better so that it really works for the people that we, it needs to work for and it really achieves the outcomes that we're here to achieve. And the second is that we're going to learn and adapt as we go. And we really mean that. So we're not setting out at the beginning to say, here is every single thing with definitive clarity that we're going to do. And we will now do that come what may, because we think that way lies failure. So whatever it is that I think we're going to do now, if we end up doing exactly that, then we failed because we haven't learned as we've gone and we haven't adapted based on what we learn. So I really encourage everybody here, if getting involved in the pilot isn't for you, then get involved in our co-design activities, follow our blog, chat to me on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter and I really like answering questions from farmers and chatting to farmers on Twitter. So do, um, do hit me up, as the young people say, I believe, um, and get involved and help us to design this future together because we all that's the only way we're going to succeed here is if we all work together. Um, I did say I'd give you a couple of highlights of the latest and things that are coming. So as I say, we've launched the um, pilot expression of interest. We're looking for several hundred farmers to work with us to help try out aspects of that scheme and help make sure it's going to really work when we roll it out. And then later this year, in the first half of this year, we'll be publishing details about the scheme and payment rates for the sustainable farming incentive when we begin to roll it out more fully from next year. So that information will come out in June. We're also very shortly, I can't say the date yet because we're waiting for our slot to be confirmed, but very shortly we'll be publishing our consultation on a lump sum exit scheme for those who want to exit the sector. We're working on the um, details of a new entrance scheme. I know there's potentially questions about that coming this evening. Um, and we'll be publishing details about our farming and protected landscapes scheme very shortly too. And finally, information about our tree health and woodland creation support that we're going to be offering between now and 2024. So this year is the year of details and delivery for the programme. 
very conscious that lots of farmers are wanting lots of details from us so that you can plan. We're working really hard to provide that for you. And there's a whole series of announcements and publications planned for this year that will help you give you the information that you need to plan. Um, and and I, but I would just finish by saying we really mean it when we talk about co-design and working together and responding to feedback. So if you don't get a chance to ask your question today, please don't hesitate to get in touch and ask your question in some other way because we're all, we're all ears and we're always help, um, happy to receive feedback and answer questions and I'm really looking forward to the discussion this evening. Thanks. Marvellous. Okay, thanks very much, Janet. Um, our next presenter is uh, Simon Haley. Uh, Simon is a rural business advisor based in the north of the country uh, and specializes in business appraisals and grant applications. Um, he's also co-founder of Carbon Metrics uh, which is a consultancy firm offering carbon audits. Um, also, I understand he's a graduate of Harper Adams University and a fellow of the Central Association of Agricultural Valuers. Uh, Simon, over to you. Uh, many thanks, Phil. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to the Farmers Weekly and uh, to Virgin uh, Money Bank for introducing me uh, and inviting me along uh, tonight. Um, I wanted to start off uh, by talking to everyone about sustainability, really. Um, I'm pretty sure when we uh, hear the word sustainability, we don't really think of it as a, buzz, as a buzzword that's only been introduced this year. It's been around a few years, but do we actually know what's at the heart of that definition? For me, it's easy to think of it in three ways. And I just want to take you through those um, in this introduction, just to get our, our minds and our, our businesses thinking in the way that DEFRA, and as Janet set out, might want to take us going through the next three years um, um, to, to, to the introduction of ELMS. So when we think about the social, the environmental, and the economic aspects of sustainability, for the social aspect, think of this public money for public goods phrase. The public money is the taxpayer's money, whether we're employing people, whether we're trying to bring new tourists into an area, that taxpayer's money that is being spent and has been spent to date and delivered to farmers in the form of subsidies, we're going to have to justify the receipt of that better, okay? So that's the social aspect of it. What, what can we do in terms of demonstrating how our businesses are adapting and changing that the consumers and the public will understand better? The environmental aspect is kind of self-explanatory. We've seen the introduction of countryside stewardship schemes, the ELM scheme coming down the line. Think of this phrase, natural capital assets. How can you demonstrate that your business is contributing to clean water, healthy soil, clean air? When these ecosystem services are going to be the main things that your farmers offer going forwards, they should be what you're thinking of as assets rather than just maybe thinking of buildings, machinery, etc. And the environment and the economic aspect of it is surely well understood. We need viable businesses. We need profitable businesses going forwards. But in terms of increasing profitability and increasing uh, performance on farm, there's two ways of doing that. And, and obviously one of those is looking at how we can improve efficiencies and cut costs on the farm. For carbon metrics and, and for our approach, we think that inherently comes down to effective data management. So if we can control those costs, if we can control the performance, but inherently if we understand where that data is coming from, how do we effectively capture it? How do we monitor it? How do we interpret it? And how do we manage it going forwards? Anecdotal evidence suggests that we can improve the efficiency of a farming business by up to 25% just by having better effective data management. So when we're going um, and looking down the line to the introduction of ELMS and where these farming businesses might be in 2025, for me, that's how we need to approach this aspect of carbon audit, sustainability audits. We can see some of the information coming out of the pilot scheme of the sustainable farming incentive. Just ask yourself, what might be that environmental baseline that DEFRA is wanting your farm to commit to and to achieve by 2025? For carbon metrics, you don't understand, though, um, you know, sometimes some of this holistic language and reports that the government come out with about achieving certain net zero targets the COP26 uh, conference later this year. I've, I've uploaded into the resources section of this, of this webinar 
a lot of reports that give you a snapshot of how this conversation about achieving the net zero agenda has developed over the past few years. Um, you can see how DEFRA, how the Treasury are starting to think about green finance, i.e. what does environmental benefits on your farm mean in pounds and pence? But if I was a dairy farmer, I'd want you to tell that to me in language I understand, pence per litre. If I was an arable farmer, I'd want to know it pounds per tonne. A poultry farmer, I might want to know it in pence per dozen. So for us, when we're doing carbon audits, when we're doing that sustainability report and putting those land management framework plans in place, it's really important that the language is communicated down the line that this doesn't just become another buzzword and a buzzword for the sake of it. It's something that has to have real effective change. And as Phil said in the introduction, change is a constant. It is not a new thing for farming businesses. It's something that we all should be used to by now. But let's try and approach this in a proactive way rather than a reactive way. This is a massively exciting time to be involved in the agricultural industry. And I'm more than happy to accept and, and answer any questions um, in this webinar about how we might look to achieve those net zero strategies for our business. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Simon. And uh, yeah, you saying there about the need for farmers to be proactive in the face of change. And I think that echoes a bit of, um, of what Janet was saying about the co-design elements of, uh, of the emerging government policy. Uh, so farmers do clearly have that opportunity uh, to get involved if, if they so wish. Um, right, our third speaker is uh, Brian Richardson. Um, and uh, Brian is UK Head of Agriculture at Virgin Money. Um, having spent all his career in agribusiness, uh, much of it running uh, businesses and farm cooperatives. Uh, latterly, he was uh, Chief Executive of the H&H &H Group in Carlisle. Uh, before joining Clydesdale and Yorkshire Bank, uh, which is now part of Virgin Money. And Brian's also a Nuffield scholar. Uh, Brian, over to you. Thank you very much for that, Phil. And uh, good evening to everyone. It's good spending some time focusing and debating the future of the farming sector. Uh, as John, Jonathan and Simon have said, there's a lot of opportunity with the various schemes and important that you build that into your future planning. That said, the change we're going to see over the next five years is going to be more significant than we've seen since joining the EU in the early 70s and, and seeing the common agricultural policy appear. Um, I think it will require every farmer to take a long, hard look at business. Uh, Ruth, if you could perhaps put the first slide up, please. Uh, Michael Gove, back in 2019, was describing the changes as a revolution in farming and appeared to be entirely focused on public goods with very little, if any, talk about the job farming does of producing food. In the last 18 months, the talk has perhaps come more balanced and given the challenge of COVID, uh, food production, food security has come much more to the fore of that debate, rightly so. Uh, but significant change it is, and we effectively see largely universal BPS payments replaced by these new schemes and farmers very much needing to opt in rather than just receiving the payments. Uh, it becomes a, an important focus for us. These payments represent 9% of income and 61% of profits. So any redistribution of these monies are potentially going to have a very significant impact. I think there's, there's three very clear focuses for the sector. Uh, the environment and public goods uh, that we've just been talking about here, we have these new schemes coming through. Uh, alongside that environmental journey, the um, DEFRA will, will take us down. There's the focus very much on net zero as well. And it's important to remember the, the industry has committed itself to being net zero by 2040. And we're now seeing supermarkets uh, come out with earlier targets than that for their farming uh, supplies, uh, with Morrison's coming out and talking about 2030. So very much a journey we're on with the environmental and public goods. This three billion of money is being redistributed uh, around, but I think we need to remember that food production is still gonna be at the heart of that. And 
uh, it will remain a, a very important focus for us going forward. So less direct money coming in from BPS, uh, more being redistributed through environmental uh, systems. Um, so very much looking, I think, at improving what we can do on the farm in terms of that food production. Doing what we can do better uh, is certainly part of that and looking at productivity. The work the AHDB has done, I think, has highlighted, uh, along with the NFU, perhaps that there is a productivity lag in the UK farming industry when we compare it with our European neighbours and some of the big players around the world. Uh, and it's something we can focus on and also a great opportunity, I think, for us. I think that will very much focus us on uh, looking forward uh, and making use of ag tech, both equipment, but also in terms of big data. And Simon's alluded to that. There's some really interesting data we have on farms. Do we always use that to its best effect? Uh, if we look at how the pig and poultry sectors, two largely unsupported uh, sectors, have addressed this in the last 10 years particularly, they've very much focused on productivity, whilst at the same time looking to improve uh, welfare and also their uh, environment around their businesses. So I think that does demonstrate what, it, what can be done. And when we look at the spread of productivity, we, we undoubtedly in the UK have some great farms, some world-class farming operations there. But in the work DEFRA was doing in the lead up to the agricultural bill, it did identify the top 25% were 1.8 times better than the bottom 25%. So perhaps we have a spread of business there uh, and it's about focusing on how we can reduce that uh, gap between the best uh, and those following. The, the third part of this, I think, is a whole industry approach. This isn't just about farming, although farming will very much be the focus of it, but we have uh, a farm input supply trade, which will need to address the, the challenges going forward as well. Undoubtedly, we're going to look to produce as much food from fewer acres using less inputs and that will potentially need to be at less cost. I've talked about in the past that the UK uh, input costs seem to be higher than the rest of Europe, so there's potential there. We have a, a fairly fragmented uh, supply trade, I think, and uh, uh, perhaps you could best describe it as a just-in-time mentality on farm in terms of, of ordering. So how can we make better use of that? I think in the east of England, where we have buying groups, they work very effectively and show significant savings to the farmers. So again, another area to look at, but it won't just be farming looking at these changes of its supply trade as well. And then the value of farm outputs, incredibly important. Uh, if we can just move on to the next slide. I think COVID has certainly highlighted the value of UK food production and food security. We saw for the first time in a generation really empty shelves last January and February. Uh, and I think there is, and I know now, there is a much greater recognition of the value of that food production. We now have a trade and agricultural commission operating to uh, make sure that any trade agreements are balanced out. And I think the retailers now are much more focused on that supply chain, where food is coming from, uh, and how that actually arrives in their supermarkets. So I think uh, perhaps a more nuanced debate going forward in terms of food. Certainly, I think there is an indication from government that they would feel the, the removal of BPS as a, a fairly crude support instrument. Uh, should focus farmers' minds on getting more for their outputs. That's a challenge, but I think the there is the opportunity there for the industry to work in a much more integrated way with uh, the food trade uh, and through that the, the supermarket trade in terms of making sure their, their outlets for their produce is there, that they can uh, have a proper balanced debate in that. Not an easy one to go forward with, but I think there's some good work being done by the likes of Arla and Corp and some of the other supermarkets now in terms of, of understanding the supply trade better, uh, bringing in the environmental requirements at the same time as looking at where the value comes from. And this is about safe and sustainable food production, I think. And you know, sustainable to me is about meeting the needs of today without compromising the ability of future generations to meet there. So undoubtedly the environmental agenda and elms will play a huge part in this and be a big focus for us. But it is about feeding the nation and supplying the, the food that uh, 
uh, ends up on the supermarket shelves as well. Uh, the UK household spends the third least amount of that uh, household budget on food in the world behind the USA and, and Singapore. So the, the UK farming industry has done a tremendous job in producing great value and high quality food and can do that in the future alongside its environmental aims, I think. Just the, the last slide, please. So just looking at uh, food production against the environmental and, and public goods side, this money is being redistributed and farmers will need to, to alongside good environmental practice, opt into a lot of these schemes. So it is going to be in a redistribution of, of the monies. There will be a significant number of farmers who have very productive land and want to focus on production. There'll be a good number who focus on, on environmental and a significant number going down the middle there. Um, I think one size won't fit all. It is important that the industry does look forward uh, and very much focus on what an individual farm unit can really do well. Everyone is going to be focused on good environmental outcomes, addressing the, the net zero challenge and uh, uh, climate change. But I think at the same time, we've got to not forget about food production, what we're all about in terms of delivering that. So if you want to finish with those slides now. So I think the message is very much about planning for the future where the environmental agenda and support payments fit in your business in the future, where the opportunities are, and as Simon has alluded to, there's going to be very many opportunities, not just within ELMS and other environmental schemes, but in the broader agenda that's going on with trees and, and carbon capture. Looking at the outputs in your business and the production, improving performance where you can, and I fully appreciate very easy for me to, someone sat here not doing that as a, as a day job to comment on that, but the, the numbers perhaps indicate there is opportunities there in terms of improving performance uh, of the industry. But the agenda is now set for the future. Yes, we need the, there will be more detail coming forward in terms of the specifics, but we know the direction of travel now. So it's important farmers start to plan their business looking forward in terms of where environment fits, what their business is going to be looking like production wise and where their profitability is going to come from in the future. So thank you very much for that. Grand. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Brian. Um, slightly overran your six, seven minutes then, but I think uh, probably sponsors prerogative and all that. And the others were a little bit less, so we're doing well on timing. Uh, right. The uh, fourth and final speaker this, uh, this evening is Charlie Flint. Um, and I imagine that uh, regular readers of Farmers Weekly probably feel they don't actually need much of an introduction to Charlie um, as his uh, musings on life on a Hampshire farm and life in general. Uh, occupy the inside back cover of the magazine every week. Uh, just a tiny bit more detail though that uh, Charlie farms 920 acres of National Trust land in central Hampshire uh, with his wife Hazel uh, where he's a second generation tenant farmer. Uh, the farm's mostly arable uh, although Hazel has um, uh, livestock, uh, cattle and uh, exlana sheep uh, enterprises on the pasture land. Uh, this I didn't know until recently, is that Charlie's also the motoring correspondent for The Field magazine. Uh, so uh, that's not the subject this evening. Uh, the future of farming is. Uh, so over to you, Charlie. Thanks, Phil. Um, two jobs tonight. Um, one is to play havoc with your timing schedule. Uh, and the other one is to be the resident farming dinosaur. Um, yeah, 920 acres rented off the National Trust. Uh, we're chemical using commodity farmers. We are the paracetamol farmers. We are uh, we use all the chemicals available to produce safe, plentiful food. What we do works at the moment. We make a profit. We get respectable yields and whisper it gently. All our soil is exactly where it always has been. Wouldn't believe it. Um, I'm not convinced that as the basic payments get phased out, nothing else will change. Um, I've seen the fertilizer prices in the last couple of months, they've gone absolutely berserk, and for no other reason than the fact that farming finances are rather good at the moment, especially in the arable world, farming finances are rather good. Prices have always done that. My son is doing a, an economics degree, the shame on the family. Um, he calls it 
price discrimination. You did send me about five pages of it, but I culled it down to just price discrimination. So those inputs, I think, will go down if farming's fortunes go down. This could be the age of the tenant, and I never thought I'd say that. My biggest cost is my rent, and it's negotiable every three years. We could be going back to the grim days of the late 90s and hauling the National Trust into a land agent's office and re reducing the rent. Um, output prices. Well, I'm amazed that 18 months ago, I ordered a huge heap of uh, wind barley seed. Told the agronomist was reluctant. He said there's no demand for wind barley. There's no demand for straw. We never got it sown that winter, of course. And two winters on, the nearby price is 170. Straw barns are empty. The phones are red hot with people looking for straw. A uh, good thing the brand new combine I've just ordered has got straw walkers. Um, if you predicted that for the future of wind barley, then I'd be delighted to hear your forecast of what's going to happen in five years' time. Having said all that, of course, we will be looking at elms um, and all the schemes, but in order for us to be interested in those and get enthusiastic about them, there are three things. Number one, they're going to have to match arable farming. They've got to match two and a half, three, three and a half tons of wheat to the acre. Maybe easy, maybe not. I don't know if you notice, but the treasury is going to be empty in a couple of months' time when the magic money machine has finished printing. And then one phone call from China sends wheat up 20 pounds a ton and growing wheat still is quite profitable. Second thing, they've got to be simple and not just land agent fodder. Um, the ELS started simply, I remember, and then it degenerated into incomprehensible mishmash of deductions, random payment dates and chaotic departmental changes I've got here. We tried the mid-tier on some pastures, and while we waited for a decision on whether we'd got in or not, we had to manage them as if the decision was going to be yes, with no guarantee that it would be a yes. So we could have had a low-input pasture and then had no decision at the end of it, which would have been a lose-lose. I hope things are better organised than that. I'd also like these schemes to make sense, especially if we're going to get penalised for not adopting them. I don't get carbon sequestration. I'm sorry. I don't get organic material suddenly not decomposing. We were taught about the carbon cycle. Is that dead? I, I don't get regenerative farming. You need glyphosate, livestock, uh, fenced off fields, massive subsidized drills, even bigger tractors to pull these. Everything that all the other greens hate. And livestock to save the planet, that one baffles me completely. Um, I don't get um, magic nutrient production, what we used to call quarry farming, which is uh, taking the P and K off fields with yields and then not replacing them. Nowadays, you seem to get, get awards and plaudits for that. We were told that was very bad practice. And the reason why about, I'm enjoying the, the debate on Facebook, <laughs> you shouldn't really do, uh, about cows and Cows are apparently net contributors to nutrients in a field. Now, call me old-fashioned, but that is a sort of bovine perpetual motion machine, which, again, I don't understand. Net zero scares the living daylights out of me. Look what it's doing to the steel industry at the moment. Um, and look what it's going to do to house prices in a couple of years' time. Luckily, I'm a tenant. It doesn't affect me. But if you've got to make your house net zero, you're going to have to spend a lot of money on it. Even the Public Accounts Committee has been hauling the authorities over this on their, their, their claims and the cost to the nation. I do worry about net zero. It seems to outsource an industry to a part of the world where they build a power station every week, coal-fired power station. I'm just hoping that doesn't come to farming. And despite everyone's efforts tonight, I still haven't heard a good description of sustainability. I've, really, I've listened hard. I've researched. Um, occasionally, it seems to verge into subsistence farming, which, is, which isn't going to feed an industrial world. Um, Extinction Rebellion will be happy, and their chums in the NFU will be happy to I suppose. I don't get the big picture, I'm afraid. We are assured that climate change is going to make food production harder, and the solution seems to be to make food production even harder. It's like the, the gods have sent famine, we must sacrifice all our livestock. It, it, it's, it's an odd way of going about it. However, having said all that, as a dinosaur farmer, if these schemes become the only way that we're going to have to keep our heads above water, 
then of course we'll hold our noses and jump in not least because every acre taken out of food production will one day make food production more important after all the concrete base of a wind turbine will never make food again so at the moment hazel and i all of our diversification involves pens hazel's done an accountancy course she works at a local racing stables that's where all the petty cash goes i think I'm lucky enough to have a weekly column for my pub brand in Farmers Weekly and a mon monthly motoring column in the field, which, as you may not know, is the only magazine old enough to have actually covered the charge of the light brigade. Um, I've had a very successful home published book, Farm Diary, got sex in it, drugs, violence, and that's just when the vet comes around. I finished book number two and I'm working on number three, but we've done no barn conversions. We've got no farm shop. We've got no office units. We did hope that a lump sum would be perfect for that, but uh, future-proofing the farm as an investment, that appears to have been cruelly withdrawn after being dangled in front of us. Um, and then there's my landlord, National Trust, whose grasp of the countryside is curious they remain convinced against all the evidence that we want to work with them that we were desperate to put on a smock lean on a gate and say dangle me in the whistles. but if push comes to shove we will do it and we'll do trailer rides and we'll do landing live if push comes to shove so i've been invited here to say our plan for the next five years well steady as she goes really we, we're going to watch we're going to wait at the moment what we're doing is working we will adopt the schemes if needed. I'd love them to be explained to me properly, but hey ho. If necessary, I'm going to leave, put on a smock and lean on a gate. And then if all this fails, well, perhaps I should we should think about setting aside and let the next generation in who are desperate to put on a pair of willies. And I'm looking forward to the day when public money for public goods becomes public money for public foods. Um, I've often wondered if it was a misprint all the time in the first place, a bit like the reasoning for the chlorothanolil ban. Um, it's not much of a plan, I have to say, but um, I'm afraid it'll have to do for now. Let's meet in five years and um, see how we've got on. Thanks, Phil. Very good. Thank you, Charlie, and uh, well done for levering in a, an advert for your book as well. So I've been disappointed if you hadn't. So um, thanks very much to the speakers. Uh, we're now um, ready to move into Q&A, but uh, before we do that, if you cast your mind back, uh, we did put up a little poll at the start. Uh, Ruth, I don't know whether you can show that on the screen. Um, doesn't actually appear on my screen, but I am told that um, it was about 30% uh, that uh, said they had expressed an interest or were considering going into SFI against 70% uh, that weren't. Uh, perhaps I could just ask you actually, Janet, does that uh, present uh, give you a lot of encouragement, uh, surprise you? I, I know DEFRA is only looking for a few hundred at this stage, yeah. but um, the fact that 30% are considering it, is that a good thing or do you need more? Yeah, no, that's really good. We, we, we only need a few hundred. We're trying to make sure we get a reasonable sample from across the country and from different types of farms so that we can make sure we're learning all we need to learn across the range of different settings and types of farm. And um, But being in a pilot isn't for everybody. So the point of the pilot is things will change. We'll be learning as we go. We'll be asking people to do learning activities. So it's not for everyone. So I'm, I'm actually surprised it's that high. Um, I think when it comes to rolling out the sustainable farming incentive for everybody, and it's not a pilot, I'd like to reverse those numbers, but it might take us a while because I recognise that we, we need to show, we need to demonstrate that it works and, and it needs to be simple, exactly as Charlie has said, and it needs to make sense for people. And people will need to see that before they make their minds up, won't they? So I think we're on a mission to make it make it all of those things and build your trust in and confidence in what we're doing. And hopefully when it comes to the main rollout, we'll re turn those figures around. We'll see in a year or two's time, won't we? You're on mute, Phil. I didn't put myself on mute, but somebody else did. Um, anyway, um, we've just got one other poll that we'll put up now, which is a similar theme, but slightly different. Uh, and that is, uh, do you plan to take part in any one of the three uh, ELM schemes? Uh, and that's a yes, no, or maybe. So do you plan to take part 
in due course at some point in the future. So have a think about that, and now we'll we'll move into the the Q and A bit. Um, and fortunately, we have a large number of questions. I don't think we're going to run out of uh, things to talk about. We'll be running out of time first. A lot of the questions that have come in um, relate to the money side of things, obviously. Um, and for example, we have one here. It says our farm struggles to break even uh, with the current level of taxpayer support. Uh, without any outside borrowing and with horse livery and B&B &B and holiday lets. So how will we survive on half the level of support post-2024? Um, similar but slightly different is what is DEFRA doing to help farmers make up the financial shortfall uh, between BPS reducing and ELBS becoming available? I'm sure part of that answer is uh, SFI, but uh, even with that, there's a delay between uh, BPS being cut this year and the scheme launching next year. But I uh, uh, don't want you to field all the questions, Janet, but I kind of think those are probably uh, too few to kick off with. Yeah, happy to. And I think the first thing to say is I wouldn't dream of presuming what the person who asked that question should do on their particular farm in their particular circumstances, and because they will know where they are, what type of farm they've got, and what their preferences are, and what the circumstances are. But I think it's, it's worth saying that we published... Um, in, in 2019, we published a compendium of all the evidence we had at that stage about farm profitability. And what and in particular, the question we were looking at was, what is the impact of withdrawing direct payments on different types of farm? And what are the options for people to make up their loss, their, 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 that loss of income? And what we found and what that evidence compendium shows is that there is a whole range of things which the more profitable farms do, which the less profitable farms might consider doing in order to become more profitable without direct payments. And they include things to do with how you farm. Not, By the way, not all of these will be applicable in all circumstances. And like I say, I wouldn't dream of telling you what to do on your farm, but some of them about how you farm. So breed selection. Um, it, it's been shown that um, if, you, if you choose the right breeds, you can increase your profits by 40%, but only half, for example, use high um, estimated breeding value bulls when they're breeding. Um, or feed efficiency or nutrient management where 50% of farmers don't have a nutrient management plan. And we know that having such a plan can help you use um, nutrients more efficiently. Um, disease control, both for plants and animals, um, reducing waste and in increasing the output um, value. So by inc improving the health of your um, your plants or, or produce, making it more marketable, diversifying. And the person who asked that question is obviously already going down that road. But there are there are kind of for other people who haven't, that's one of the routes. And, and the more profitable farmers tend to have gone down that route and tend to be making much greater return for their for their diversification. And then there are things around the take up of innovative practices where we, we think the system of creating innovative practices and seeing them being taken up can be greatly improved. And we'd like to see quicker and more rapid take up of things that can make you more efficient, whether that's technology or kit or whether it's just farming practices to do with how you do your rotation, for example. And we see relatively low uptake of new information and new ways of practicing that we know can make farms more efficient. And then there's a whole set of business practices, business management practices, which the more profitable farms will tend to do and the less profitable farms tend not to do. And those tend to be around understanding your costs, as one of the other speakers has already said, having business plans, managing your budget, managing your risk, taking part in discussion groups um, and collaborating with other farmers. And so in addition to agri-environment schemes and the new schemes through environmental land management and the productivity support that DEFRA is going to be providing. There's a whole range of things that we think farmers can do. And when it comes to what we're going to do to help with that, well, we're going to provide these new schemes where you can get paid to produce public goods and all of the money that comes out of direct payments will go back into the sector through either those schemes or the productivity schemes. We're going to provide free advice for farmers and we've just today published um, and a call for um, applications for grants to provide advice to farmers about to help them plan their way through the transition. So if you're not if you're worried about what to do and you want an expert to advise you and not just me telling you what the general rules are, then we'll provide that expert advice from this summer. And um, we're going to be providing grants, both small grants for smaller pieces of kit and large grants for big investments. And we generally see that farmers that invest in those types of equipment see a really good productivity and profitability return. Um, in addition to that, we're, we're working on a scheme to support new entrants where we know that there are particular difficulties that are faced by new entrants. And we're working with people from the sector, including new entrants, to design that scheme. So if you'd like to get involved in that, do get in touch afterwards. Um, we're running an exit scheme for those who decide that they would like to exit the sector. 
So that's if you decide you want to exit the sector, you can cash out your remaining BPS entitlements. And we're just about to publish a consultation about what that scheme will involve to help you then decide whether that's the right thing for you. And then finally, there are things we're doing to support innovation, research and development. And as I said, the wider take up of those innovations and learning and development in farming. Um, and the sector has come together to suggest an, an institute for agriculture and horticulture to help farmers in their professional development beyond college and throughout their career. In all other professions, you would have that sort of membership and, and body that will be able to help you to do that and we're going to support one for agriculture too and that's a, that's a thing that's come from the sector and then the final thing I'd say about how we're helping is that evidence compendium that I mentioned what the evidence showed us was that if we were just to withdraw basic payments overnight that would have a really significant impact and farmers wouldn't have time to adapt and plan and and find their way through and that's why we decided to roll this program out over seven years so that everybody can and we've published the information about how we're reducing the direct payments over that time so that you can see what's happening and you can plan for your business and you can have time to make the changes that you need to make so I hope you can see there that there's a lot of things that we're doing to try to help there's a lot of options available to farmers the thing I would say is don't wait to start thinking about planning this do take advice do have a look at the options um, and do start planning and making changes um, and tell us if you think there are more things that we could be doing or should be doing to help, then tell us, because as I said at the beginning, we're all ears when it comes to hearing feedback about what we're doing and making sure that it's going to work for you. So if there are extra things that you think we should be doing that I've not just listed there or if you think we can do them better, then I'd love to hear. I'm all ears and let me know. And we'll, we'll we, we consider all the feedback we receive. That's not a promise to do absolutely everything anybody asks us to do, because obviously we have limited budget and we have to make decisions about what's the best way to, to invest the money. But we certainly do listen to feedback and we'd love to hear from anyone with any different ideas. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, Janet. I think that's about 25 answers in, in one. So <laughs> good effort. Um, perhaps I can put the same question to Simon. Um, do you kind of think it's inevitable that uh, there will be leakage uh, from the system as we move to to the new world and and what advice would you give to your clients um, on how to plug the gaps and uh, make up for that loss of bps yeah thanks phil um I, personally I, I think you know there's been a number of years now while uh, farmers have had time to 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 know what's coming down the line to adapt going forwards, whether it's the introduction of the countryside stewardship scheme that has been available since 2016, whether it's the past 12, 18 months of knowing that there's certain changes happening, not knowing what those grants or schemes might be called, but knowing there's something coming down the line. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sometimes quite bullish and blunt about it. You know, you, we've got to look after our own businesses. You know, the most simple equation that any farm business can be doing at the moment is to be looking at their annual profits on their accounts, removing that BPS payment and working out whether that is still a viable business without that payment going forwards. If it is, great, but it doesn't mean you are safe. There's plenty that we can do to practice better efficiencies. If it is not viable without that payment, then we definitely need to be encouraging better adoption and better understanding of these schemes at the moment. You know, I have a real passion actually for trying to uh, kind of explain the detail, um, take away some of the rhetoric, take away some of the fluff. Let's talk about it in a one page PDF rather than a hundred page PDF. Um, and sometimes, you know, that, that kind of, perception or forethought that you might have had in 2015 that uh, to, 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 to be a farm of the future in DEFRA's eyes that does not produce food, that butts everything down to conservation or planting wildflower meadows is, is quite frankly an attitude of the past in my opinion. Stewardship is a flexible scheme. Sustainable farming incentive will be a flexible scheme. Yes, the pilot this year might look totally different to the SFI in 2022 and might look completely different again to what SFI is in 2025. But we have a roadmap now. Same as we talk about a roadmap to net zero. As an advisor, I'm encouraging my farming clients and businesses to get on that roadmap sooner rather than later. If we understand that the SFI will be let's say the base level 
of elms going forwards. I don't, I'm not sure if we're now to, to use tears anymore, Janet, or whether COVID uh, uh, take, uh, took, took, took that phrase out of our, our lexicon. But you look at the SFI pilot, it talks about farm woodland standards. It talks about various levels within those standards that you should put yourself forward as a farm to say, I am happy to achieve. It is more than the standard regulatory baseline. When we get to the next level or tier, which is the um, kind of a local nature recovery uh, approach, is that collaboration of farmers working together? Is that the CS facilitation fund in a different way? Is that putting a land management plan together where a carbon audit or a sustainability framework is integral to the design of that scheme? Uh, when we start thinking about the wider um, landscape recovery scale, you know, we're talking something on a more of a national scale, perhaps more than regional or local. But this is down the line. You know, I sometimes get frustrated that we are talking about schemes that are happening in 2025 and beyond. We're still in 2021 at the moment. This is the first year that the BPS will be less in your bank account in December. You will see a reduction in that. If you are applying for new schemes this year, that payment might not drop until December 2022. So you're already playing catch up. So when I'm talking in my introduction about effective data management, looking at the efficiencies of businesses, it's how we can also save money, not always chase new money. Um, hope that helps, Phil. Indeed it does, thanks, thanks very much. Um, right, we have a question for Brian, and I know it's a question for Brian because it says question for Brian, and it's from uh, Jeremy Higgs. Um, and he asks that why is there such a strong focus on farm productivity as opposed to farm profitability? Um, and he then talks about the emphasis always being on cutting costs, controlling costs. Uh, why not uh, increasing your income by capturing better prices? Um, Brian, have you any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I think yeah. it's a very good question. I think it, it's very much about having a blended approach to this. And uh, it is about looking at costs um, at the same time, improving outputs and, and not no single one part of uh, the areas on, on the farm are going to deal with that. But I think um, productivity probably covers everything. It, it isn't just about improving outputs. It's about that optimising what you're actually doing and understanding what you're doing. I think th this huge variation we see in performance on farms, it does highlight you know, how do individual farm units know actually how they're doing when comparing against everyone else, not just the neighbour, but, but the wider industry there. I think you know, the, the days of being able to easily benchmark through centralised scheme are, are largely gone now. And so um, focusing on productivity, outputs that you're providing, um, which covers costs, uh, and really focusing in on that is going to be part of the way forward. And I think, as uh, Janet said before, when DEFRA have been looking at how farms can be sustainable in the future, bearing in mind that that figure of 61% of, of support payments currently, or, or support payments make up 61% of uh, profitability on farms at the moment, there is going to be potentially a big gap to make up. Um, output prices as well play an important part of that. And again, I think the work DEFRA did when looking at, at the future of uh, agriculture and schemes very much focused in on there that BPS has perhaps provided a, a buffer that has meant uh, farmers and those buying from farmers have been able to uh, mask the real cost of food production. So hopefully that leads a way forward there so i think this is very much a blended approach as i say easy for me to to sit here uh and, and talk about productivity and i think charlie made some very good points in terms of the work that every farmer does every day in making their unit as good as it possibly could sustaining it for for the future and being as as productive as they can but i think with new technology coming along Certainly big data offers some really exciting prospects going forward. I think there are opportunities there to look at individual 
outputs on farms and see how they can be improved. And yes, it is about profitability at the end of the day and improving profitability. But I think productivity comes along with that. I think most of what we produce on farms is effectively you know, high quality commodity going into supermarkets. So it's very difficult for everyone to look at adding value there. And so uh, looking forward, I, th I think it is focusing in on all, all those elements, really looking at your own business uh, and hopefully moving forward. And it, I think there are you know, some good opportunities there. One of the things Janet mentioned was, was you know, the, the difference in outputs from using different breeding stock and improving breeding stock. And I think uh, one of the breeding companies, a stabilizer cattle company, has done some work there in terms of highlighting the value of productivity, not just in terms of improving profits, uh, but also in terms of reducing carbon outputs, because the more you're producing from less, effectively, is, is producing carbon. So very much a blended approach, very much looking at individual businesses and the environmental side will, will work alongside that as well, I think. OK, thanks very much, Brian. Uh, perhaps uh, we can come to you, Charlie, on that as well. Uh, at a practical level, what are you doing on, on your farm uh, in terms of improving productivity, controlling costs, and how do you go about trying to uh, get the best price possible for whatever your your product is? Again, very boring, very dinosaur. Um, we are members of a buying group uh, who, in theory, I mustn't say in theory, who, uh, when we with the agronomist has finished and says, right, we need 200 litres of water, whatever, they put it out to electronic tender um, and the cheapest people get the deal and it gets delivered. We get 10 vans in a day instead of the old days when it was one van. Um, and at the other end, we joined Hampshire Grain, now Trinity Grain, many years ago. Um, not just because then they get on and do all the marketing, but they also do all the cleaning, they do all the storing. As tenant farmers, that suited us brilliantly because we have a landlord with a very sharp book when it comes to buildings. Um, and the, there's no point as a tenant building spending 80, 90,000 on a new grain store when in the end it belongs to your landlord. Uh, so we have an off-farm asset, which is brilliant. But also uh, we leave Trinity Grain to get as good a prices as uh, they can. Uh, Eight times out of nine, I'm very happy. Um, I should probably more than that. But I challenge myself to do better, and I don't think I could. So I, I'm actually pretty well the tractor driver. Um, I let other people keep the uh, input costs as low as possible, and I let other people maximise the output costs. Um, that's, that suits us really well, and I can get on and sit in my tractor. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Um, just on the uh, subject of productivity, there's a question here um, about uh, the new Farming Investment Fund. Uh, please, can you tell me more? Uh, so uh, how much will it be worth? Uh, when will the grants be awarded? Uh, who's going to be able to apply? What sort of things will it cover? Um, so I think uh, probably back to you, Janet, if you can give us a little bit more detail on the Farming Investment Fund. What, why, where, how? I can. So we'll be publishing more information about this um, over the course of the spring and summer and applications for it will open in November or December. Um, and it includes small grants for pieces of kit that you need on your farm and larger grants for you to invest in machinery or kit or technology. Um, and we'll be publishing all the lists of what you can invest in and, and what the criteria are and all of, the, all of that kind of information later in the year. It builds on the small and large productivity grants that we have now, but we've been talking to people who use those and who don't take those up because they don't work for them to find out what is it that works about those, what is it that doesn't. And we're revising the list, we're revising the eligibility rules, we're revising the way that we decide how much to provide through those grants to try to make it a broader appeal and work for more people. So more information to come in the next couple of months and then the actual scheme will open towards the end of the year. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the question come in live from uh, Tom Runciman, I think. hope that pronunciation is close enough. Uh, and he refers to the recent Morrison's uh, decision and some other supermarkets about their plans for going 
uh, net zero by 2035. Uh, do you expect that imported foods will have to meet the same criteria? Um, and will uh, consumers be prepared to pay more? Uh, will domestic producers simply be undercut? Um, sort of uh, net zero carbon territories. So I think probably, Simon, that's uh, one for you. Thanks, Phil, and uh, thanks, Tom, for the question. Um, it, it does feel there's not a day goes by at the moment without another company uh, jumping up and uh, putting the PR machine into good effect and, uh, and, and stating their net zero plans 2040, 2035, 2030, and waiting until we get 2029 and, 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 and lower than that. I think the question about imported foods, um, there was another question, Phil, uh, that we've had uh, prior to the event about using carbon audits and, and net zero results as a marketing tool for produce as well. For me, I guess, I guess the simple answer at the moment, Tom, is there's no data accredit accreditation for all of these audits and, and all of these plans that are currently being put into place. Yes, there are various carbon calculators out there. Yes, some of them are free to use. And yes, in the main, they work to the IPPC standards, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and, and set themselves various targets. However, there is no set carbon standard that I believe any of them work to or that DEFRA um, certainly kind of enforces or, or, or suggests in that respect. You know, my advice would be pick one, do an audit, repeat the process annually, set your own baseline or monitor the trends between them as you're going along. In terms of using it as a marketing tool, in terms of thinking about net zero strategies as something um, that might um, kind of uh, give greater credence to domestic product over importing product. It is certainly something that is becoming more prevalent in the eyes of the consumer. If you think back to the early 2000s, there was the likes of Quaker Oats and Walkers that tried marketing with carbon um, um, assurance on, 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 on products and it didn't work. It didn't seem to have any effect. Fast forward now to 2020 and 2021, you see the likes of Brewdog, um, you see the likes of Adnams, you see the likes of uh, Quorn, certainly making that more prominent on their packaging. It's, it's interesting, though, to think with these net zero strategies when it comes from the supply chain, please don't be under any illusion that indirectly your farm will probably get picked up within that process. Morrisons are certainly not going to come out um, with a with a nice PR um, um, article saying that they want to get net zero without expecting that the suppliers within their chain would also need to be net zero in some shape or form as well. So I think we're all in it together. But if we are being led in a certain direction, why would you not as a farming business and relating back to something I said earlier, not want to be proactive about that change management, understand what your carbon footprint position is at the moment. And there are various tools out there to help you do that. Once you have that data and you can learn how to interpret it correctly, how do you then put in place effective mitigation strategies and take control of your own outputs? That would be my response, Phil. Hopefully that was useful. And, and a, a sort of follow-up question there is um, about how carbon credits can be monetized. Uh, how can a farmer actually take advantage of, of, of an emerging market for carbon credits? Is that uh, something you could comment on, Simon? Yes, certainly. Um, there are some fledgling carbon trading schemes out there. Um, carbon credits is not all about simply planting woodland on your farm, waiting a set number of years and then selling it off or, 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 or putting it on the government's reverse auction. Um, there are many private companies out there looking at the moment and certainly looking down the line in the next few years as to how they can enter this market. Might that raise the price, you know, um, certainly two, three, four, five fold if there's a demand in the market? 
our current uh, approach and um, an, an opinion on that particular question, though, Phil, is there's probably more value, uh, more financial value, certainly, in making sure that you can control your own carbon management on farm rather than simply looking for a quick fix to try and sell it off in credits in the next couple of years. A, 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 a carbon positive farm is going to be in the main a farm that is more effective and, and more efficient in the main anyway. So that will help to substitute any loss of BPS income. It might help to substitute um, people who do not want to enter any stewardship schemes. Don't think of it as a quick fix. Think of it as a net zero strategy plan. Also on the, on the same subject, and probably uh, one for Janet, it's uh, uh, James Frankpitt asking, uh, is DEFRA going to provide a recognised methodology for farmers to measure and monitor carbon sequestration uh, in their soils to secure carbon credits? I'm not sure if this is your exact area, but maybe you have a, a, any insight into that, or if not, say not. It's not it's not my particular specialist area. I'm not aware of any plan for us to do that, but we are talking a lot to the very large range of people who are trying to work on methods to do this. And I know that there are teams in DEFRA who are talking to those people. Certainly within the kind of schemes that we're designing, our focus at the moment at least is much more on paying farmers to take actions that we know are on average likely to achieve good outcomes for biodiversity, water quality, carbon reduction, um, and air quality, amongst other things, rather than paying for, for the outputs and outcomes. And that's because we think that's a much fairer and more reasonable way to do it, given the state of the market in measurements of outcomes and payment and the option for payment by results right now. But this is one of the things where we should expect the science and methods to develop over the course of our programme and why it's so important that we're taking a test and learn approach, because I'm saying that right now, but in five years time, there might be a really widely recognised very practical, commonly accepted way to measure outcomes on farms that everybody thinks is fair and we should be ready to adapt should that happen, and we will. Okay, thanks. Um, perhaps we could uh, have a look at the second poll that we put up a while ago at the start of the Q&A. Um, Ruth, if you can put that on people's screens. The question was, uh, do you plan to take part in any one of the three environmental land management schemes? Yes, no, or maybe. And um, it seems uh, I've got 54% saying yes, 13% uh, saying no, and 33% maybe undecided, but over half uh, definitely uh, considering putting uh, going into one of those three schemes. Um, Brian, perhaps um, have you got any comment on that? Is that uh, where you'd like to see uh, your banking clients uh, heading? Um, or would you want to see that figure being higher at this stage? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think, interestingly, just on the basis of what we were talking about earlier in terms of the total monies uh, and how it's distributed, I think there will need to be at least that level of uptake and perhaps higher. And I think, you know, ac across all areas, there'll be choices made there as to go through. And it, it will be focused geographically and by farm type as well. Um, you know, if you look at some of the uh, biggest challenges around in terms of where money is going to be removed and needs to be replaced, it's certainly in the livestock sector, I think, uh, the beef and sheep farmers, and there'll be significant numbers of those in terms of volume wanting to be in these schemes. I think some of the uh, more productive land, particularly in the east of the country, uh, and some of the horticultural land, it will be less attractive. Uh, so I think it will be mixed picture. I think that that's encouraging to, to see that number. I think it will grow over time as people start to understand the schemes and also how they can support uh, the carbon and net zero message as we go forward. OK, thank you. Uh, time is marching on. So we've only got about five or six minutes left. Uh, we had quite a few questions in earlier um, about uh, new entrants and uh, possibility of a new entrance scheme um, linked to uh, lump sum payments and, and the like. But the uh, question here was, uh, what's the one piece of advice that you could give to a new entrant starting out in agriculture right now? Um, as a farmer, Charlie, 
uh, what would be your one piece of advice to somebody starting out now? Slip your neck. Uh, it's a long job. Uh, we took over here in 91. Uh, took over from Dad. God, it was a nightmare. We fought and we fought. And we... Anyway, um, and everything was going splendidly. And then 25 years ago, BSE came along, 21st March 96. day my daughter was born. Uh, and then we had four or five years of not a lot of fun. 48 pounds a ton for barley. Um, and then the years go by and the years go by. And eventually here we are. Well, we're just coming up to 30 years running the farm. It's a long old job. You don't farm for next week. You farm for 20 years time. It's a cliche, I know. But uh, that's the only advice I would give. And and, and, and if, if, uh, if you're questioning, I, I find it. It's very difficult to put into words. If 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 people are, if you know you're going to be a farmer, you know you're going to be a farmer, and, and there's really no advice. I think very little advice you can give. If you're in, in your overalls at six, when you when you were six, you came home from school, and you climb into your overalls, go and find dad. Then there's not much advice you can get from me. Uh, same same question to to Simon as a consultant. Thanks, Phil. Um, what's my one piece of advice for a for a young farmer looking to get into the industry? Probably just to be realistic about what you're what you're getting yourself into. Plan everything on a conservative basis. Remove any um, kind of uh, you know what's the what's the right phrase? Re remove any kind of uh, any pub talk that you hear. Pub yields things that your mates will tell you when they're just bigging up their own farming enterprises to, to make themselves either feel better about themselves or it's been a crap day because it rained and you made the wrong decision or you looked at the wrong weather app. Just be realistic about it. As Charlie said, if it's in your heart of hearts that you know you want to do it, you're already on the right path. What I would suggest, and it's something that Janet alluded to earlier as well, is take advantage of some of the free support that's out there there's plenty of um, um, outlets, whether it's the Henry Plum Foundation that offers mentoring and financial support, whether it's some of the new schemes that offer um, um, free advisor support. Take your kind of mind outside of your comfort zone as well. Go to conferences like the Cultivate Conference. Think about doing some of these leadership courses where you can work on your business, not necessarily always in your business. And I think that is certainly a very good place to start, um, I would say. OK, um, I see we've been given an extra five minutes, so that's good news. Um, and question. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Charlie is waving at me. Back to you, Charlie. I've just remembered what you should tell a new entrant. Do something every month to baffle your neighbours. Is that by, by writing baffling things in Farmers Weekly? Right. No, 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 uh, it's, 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 it, you do, it means you, you do something out of your comfort zone every month. Okay. Um, the question came in, um, is there a future for small farms in the 100 to 200 acre bracket? Um, Brian, uh, small farms? Yeah, I think it's not all about scale. Scale certainly helps in some cases, but I think uh, smaller farms focused on what they're doing, recognising what's actually possible on that farm in terms of uh, outputs and, and the income on that farm, and really having a, a realistic understanding then of, of what's feasible. I think where smaller units often come under challenge i think is is where you know there's a lot of mouths taking uh, income out of the farm uh and yeah that obviously interferes with the sustainability i think you know smaller units can often provide great attention to detail uh in terms of what they're doing good outputs um often you know very close to marketing 
And I think those small units can also probably take advantage of, as, as Charlie alluded to, I think that there are organisations out there that, that mean you don't need to do everything. So, you know, Charlie mentioned the Grain Group is part of. There's in the east of England, certainly, the, there's some first class uh, buying groups that can create that scale that you need. So I think, yes, perhaps more of a challenge, uh, but not impossible just need to be very focused on what you're doing and plug into other organizations where you can. And uh, Janet, does uh, DEFRA have a, a view on small family farms? A lot of uh, uh, noise coming from uh, uh, groups looking at uh, agroecology, agroforestry, um, small farmer interests, interest groups. Um, does DEFRA have a, a view on this? Um I don't think we have a kind of official view as to how many small farms there should be, but I think we, we can see that there's a, exactly as you say, there's a very active community of um, very, very progressive, very productive, very profitable small farms. I think it depends where you are and what sort of farm you have and what resources you have available to you, of course, doesn't it? So I think there's no, there's no such thing as a typical small farm any more than there is a typical any other sort of farm, really. Um, but I think, I think the kind of the regenerative practices and mixed farming are particularly relevant to small farms aren't they and particularly seem to be being adopted in that situation I think there's lots of lots to be said for working out how you can collaborate particularly on fixed costs and um, the kind of local marketing and vertical integration kinds of things when you've got small farms all in one local area and I know there's lots of communities that are doing that already I was speaking to a farmer recently in Cumbria who's looking at that looking at a cooperative kind of model in their local area so I think probably there's going to be a need to be creative about how to make sure that you're profitable and look at all the things that I was mentioning right at the beginning about how to make sure your farm is profitable and some some of those will be more appropriate for small farms than others but I think we would certainly say there's a future for small farms and the future is quite exciting actually if you look at what some of the leading farmers are doing in that part of the sector. Okay thank you. Um, Probably just take two more questions. Um, and this one is around um, self-sufficiency. Uh, if more land is taken out of commercial production uh, for environmental schemes, how will we make up the shortfall in UK food production? Uh, we hear this a lot, uh, currently about 60% self-sufficient. Uh, is the inevitable trend downwards um, or how can we avoid that? Um, Brian, what are your thoughts on the self-sufficiency question? Yeah, it's an interesting one. And you, you mentioned 60% self-sufficiency. I think it'll be a challenge to uh, become more self-sufficient than that because of the the, the choices around uh, food production, etc. I think um, there will be, you know, inevitably the, the new environmental schemes are going to take uh, production out uh, to, to uh, extensify land use. But I think remaining farms particularly those in productive areas where where there's opportunity to uh improve outputs will take that up and i think i i think ultimately we'll see fewer acres producing just as much food with all those you know good environmental practices around it so i think looking forward um there's opportunity there to at least maintain and, and hopefully improve that self-sufficiency but you know, we're in a very cosmopolitan world in terms of uh, what consumers want. Uh, and so I think it'd be a challenge to improve on that. But I think we can certainly sustain where we are at the moment. And I, as I said earlier, I think the, the renewed focus on, on food production in the UK post-COVID has, has certainly helped that debate. And we, ne we need to keep that debate live going forward and, and, and not lose it. Okay. Uh, right. I think actually we'll probably call it uh, to a close there. Uh, we've got through a fair number of the questions that came in both before and during the, the webinar. So that was grand. Um, so just a couple of sort of final bookkeeping things at the end. Um, first to say that the uh, session has been recorded. So if you're internet went down or um, you want to relive those moments or whatever, uh, I had to leave, um, then it'll be up on the Farmers Weekly on FWI um, tomorrow at some point. And I think all people who registered will get an email to point them to uh, to the recording of, of the session. So uh, you will be able to see it again. 
And apart from that, it's just for me to thank, uh, first of all, um, Virgin Money for um, sponsoring the evening, much appreciated. Uh, to thank, of course, uh, the speakers who have done done a great job. Uh, really interesting points made by all of them, uh, both in presentations and in response to the Q and A. So, you know, big round of applause or virtual applause uh, to to the speakers. And uh, finally, thanks to the to the audience. As I said, we had an amazing number register. Uh, I'll be interested to see the actual numbers that took part, but it's going to be in the hundreds, which was was brilliant. Uh, so thanks very much for everyone for listening. And uh, I just wish you all a, a pleasant uh, rest of your evening. So thanks very much indeed. Thanks, everyone. Thank everyone. you.